Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Taken at the Flood by Agatha Christie. So, uh, as always, I'm going to start by reading the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs as I go along, and then I'm going to share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, death in the blitz. Gordon Cloward is killed in an air raid on London. He has left no will, and his vast fortune passes to his young wife, Rosaline. But five other people have been promised to share in that fortune. Five people who desperately need the money. Now it can only become theirs if Rosaline should happen to die before them. There are five people with a strong motive for murder, and violent murder is committed. But Rosaline is not the victim. So in the prologue, we have here a pretty interesting in introduction. In every club, there is a club bore. The Coronation Club was no exception, and the fact that an air raid was in progress made no difference to normal procedure. And we get a quote from Poirot here, he says, uh, One should never struggle against the inevitable. If a middle-aged lady wearing sham your... If a middle-aged wear, if a middle-aged lady wearing sham Egyptian beads has made up her mind to see the famous Hercule Poirot and has come up from the country to do so, nothing will deflect her. She will sit there in the hall till she gets her way. Show her in, George. And someone's talking to Poirot and uh, betrays her own ignorance here. She says, uh, "Now listen, my brother Gordon married some weeks before his death a young widow, a Mrs. Underhay. Her first husband, poor child, such a grief to her, was reported dead in Africa, a mysterious country, Africa." A mysterious continent, Poirot corrected her. I know, so this, this batshit crazy lady, Mrs. Claude, um, she's convinced that she's received a message from the spirit world telling her to go and consult with Hercule Poirot. And we have here, uh, oh dear, but surely it is most unfortunate. I and my husband are very badly off, very badly off indeed. Actually, my own plight is worse than my dear husband knows. I bought some shares under spirit guidance, and so far they have proved very disappointing. In fact, quite alarming. They have gone right down and are now, I gather, practically unsaleable. I've made some money on the stock market. Not a huge amount, but there's some alright money. Well, I'm still, I still have shares, so they could still tank and I could still lose everything. So uh, here we have chapter one of book one, because there's this that bit before it was a bit of a, a sort of a prologue, uh, in function if not in name. Oh, it is, it is actually called a prologue as well. Uh, but I want to read you the first couple of paragraphs out of uh, book one, chapter one, because I think they do a great job of establishing a sense of place. Wormsley Heath consists of a golf course, two hotels, some very expensive modern villas going onto the golf course, a row of what were before the war luxury shops, and a railway station. Emerging from the railway station, a main road roars its way to London on your left. To your right, a small path across a field is signposted, footpath to Wormsley Vale. Wormsley Vale, tucked away amongst wooded hills, is as unlike Wormsley Heath as well can be. It is, in essence, a microscopic old-fashioned market town now degenerated into a village. It has a main street of Georgian houses, several pubs, a few unfashionable shops, and a general air of being 150 instead of 28 miles from London. And uh, they're talking about the bombings here, and someone says, The truth is that one never believes for a minute, no matter what danger you're in, that you yourself are going to be killed. The bomb is always going to hit the other person. I'm just going to read this section out. Uh, there's a few paragraphs here that go back to back that I think are uh, pretty good. She quickened her pace. She wanted to get out of Wormsley Vale, up, up onto the hills and open spaces. Setting out at a brisk pace, she soon felt better. She would go for a good tramp of six or seven miles and really think things out. Always, all her life, she'd been a resolute, clear-headed person. She had known what she wanted and what she didn't want. Never until now had she been content just to drift along. Yes, that was just what it was. Drifting along, an aimless, formless method of living. Ever since she had come out of the service, a wave of nostalgia swept over her for those war days. Days when duties were clearly defined, when life was planned and orderly, when the, weight of when the weight of individual decisions had been lifted from her. But even as she formulated the idea, she was horrified at herself. Was that really and truly what people were secretly feeling everywhere? Was that what ultimately war did to you? It was not the physical dangers, the mines at sea, the bombs from the air, the crisp ping of a rifle bullet as you drove over a desert track. No, it was the spiritual danger of learning how much easier life was if you ceased to think. She, Lynn Marchman, was no longer the clear-headed, resolute, intelligent girl who had joined up. Her intelligence had been specialised, directed in well-defined channels. Now mistress of herself and her life once more, she was appalled at the disinclination of her mind to seize and grapple with her own personal problems. With a sudden wry smile, Lynn thought to herself, Odd if it's really that newspaper character, the housewife, who has come into her own through war conditions. The women who, hindered by innumerable shall nots, were not helped by any definite shalls. Women who had to plan and think and improvise, who had to use every inch of the ingenuity they'd been given, and to develop an ingenuity that they didn't know they'd got. They alone, thought then now, could stand upright without a crutch, responsible for themselves and others. 
And she, Lynn Marchmont, well educated, clever, having done a job that needed brains and close application, was now rudderless, devoid of resolution. Yes, hateful word, drifting. We have a character who says, if Rowley really loved me, he'd have got that 500 pounds to me somehow. He would, he would. He wouldn't let me be humiliated by having to take it from David. David. You can't say someone doesn't really love you because they don't have enough money to just give you for you to spunk away on whatever the fuck it was. We get this exchange which I like because it kind of nods at the tropes. Uh, what, in your opinion, Graves, does the watch tell us? Graves murmured warily. Seems as though it might give us the time the crime was committed. Ah, said Spence. When you've been as long in the force as I have, you'll be a little suspicious, spelled like that, of anything so convenient as a smashed watch. It can be genuine, but it's a well-known hoary old trick, H-O-A-R-Y, not the other type. Turn the hands of a watch to a time that suits you, smash it, and out with some virtuous alibi. But you don't catch an old bird that way. I'm keeping a very open mind on the subject of the time this crime was committed. Medical evidence is between 8pm and 11pm. So you can bet the medical evidence will turn out to be fudged. Somebody stands there, Major Porter, he stands there, an erect soldierly figure. As though on parade. <laughs> we get this little conversation uh, here between uh, the Inspector Spence and Hercule Poirot. So Poirot says, and what, and what happens? I will ask you this, Superintendent. What happens to the ivy when the oak round which it clings is struck down? That's hardly a question in my line, said Spence. You think not? I think it is. Character, mon cher, does not stand still. It can gather strength. It can also deteriorate. What a person really is, is only apparent when the test comes. That is, the moment when you stand or fall on your own two feet. Oh, sorry, no two, on your own feet. Uh, Poirot says, c'est un beau paysage, which I believe means, it's a nice country or it's a nice area. He likes it there. We get this little passage, which is very typical, both of the times, but of some people today. The lounge, she said, is reserved for persons staying in the hotel. I am staying in the hotel, replied Hercule Poirot. The old lady meditated for a moment or two before returning to the attack. Then she said accusingly, you're a foreigner. Yes, replied Hercule Poirot. In my opinion, said the old lady, you should all go back. Go back where, inquired Poirot. To where you came from, said the old lady firmly. She added as a kind of rider, sotto voce, foreigners and snorted. That, said Poirot mildly, would be difficult. Nonsense, said the old lady. That's what we fought the war for, isn't it? So that people could go back to their proper places and stay there. And then we get a reference. Uh, Funny, isn't it? He said, how often you come back to the same old formula. Cherchez la femme. It says the superintendent's French accent was not as good as, super, as Sergeant Graves's, but he was proud of it. So he probably said, Cherchez la femme. Or even, Cherchez la femme. So um, Poirot asks someone if, if they're going to marry someone else and he says, but, but you are going to marry Rowley Claude. Am I? I wish I knew. That's what I was trying to decide that day when David burst out of the wood. It was like a great question mark in my brain. Shall I? Shall I? Even the train in the valley seemed to be asking the same thing. The smoke made a fine question mark in the sky. And uh, Lynn says, uh, you see, I've never trusted David. Can you love someone you trust? Unfortunately, yes. It's pretty deep. So yeah, overall, um, taking at the flood, it was okay. I'd give it like a 3.5 out of 5. I will caveat this by saying what I always say, which is that even Christy at her worst is better than most at her best. Having said that, she definitely isn't at her best in this. It is just okay. Uh, I'm glad I've read it because I'm glad I can tick it off and that's one more closer to uh, having read all of Agatha Christie's books. But overall, it was pretty unmemorable and wouldn't recommend it unless you're like a diehard fan. It's definitely not one to, to start with. So there we have it, that's what I made of Taken at the Flood by Agatha Christie. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.